Okay, so here's a fun one. Entry tenants treat guests almost like full users unless you tell it not to. And what that means is that they can see, share, and access oftentimes way more than most admins realize. And not only that, but by default, guest users in Entra, they're gonna exist forever. I'm Rick Campbell, Microsoft MVP for Threatscape. And in this video, we're gonna look at five of the most common guest security and management mistakes we see in real environments. So let's get into it. Let's recap exactly what a guest is before we dig into these top five commonly seen mistakes. Entra tenants, they're secure, isolated environments. You have your users and I have my users. But what we eventually may encounter is, well, if I want to work with another organization, I want to collaborate on things like SharePoint and Teams with them. Well, those full users and other tenants, they can become guest users in my tenant. And that ends up looking a little bit something like this, where all of a sudden, the member users of another tenant, they're now in my tenant, they're going to have risks and they previously existed only in their tenant. So that could be the risk that the user has been compromised. Maybe that user is just up to bad stuff in general without even being compromised. So that insider risk. Well, all of a sudden, as soon as I have guests, their risks become my risks. So we need to contend with that. So let's get the ball rolling by looking at mistake number one. And for that, I'm going to pivot over to my lab and we're going to talk about the fact that Entra by default has some kind of uh, less restrict rules on what guests can and can't see than we would otherwise like. So to explain that, I'm going to head to the Entra Admin Center. I'm going to go to Users. I'll go to User Settings. And by the way, you can call out guests based on this user type attribute. You can see here I got a guest there. I'll go to User Settings and we're going to look at this section here called Guest User Access Settings. The one that is Currently selected is uh, this is the default here, this second option there. Guest users have limited access to properties. And what that really means is that this guest user, they can still see a whole bunch of stuff I otherwise might not want them to see. For example, they could see who folks' managers are. They could see who their direct reports are. They could even see things like uh, the membership of groups that they're not even joined to. So what we may choose to do, and what I would encourage a lot of folks to do, there, there are niche cases and edge cases where this might not be appropriate, is to choose this option down here, this most restrictive option. And what that's going to do is that's going to contain their ability to review the directory. Again, this used to be easier to explain when it was called Azure AD, clues in the name, it's a directory. This is going to limit it so that they can only see, um, for example, their own user properties rather than user properties of other folks in the tenant. And certainly an option that we almost universally would want to avoid is uh, this one here, this kind of most inclusive setting. And what that allows us to do is treat these guests almost like full users who can, with very uh, limited scope on preventing it, perform re reconnaissance of the entire directory so they can look at all groups and all users and all that kind of stuff. So that's mistake number one that we see is you have to choose what setting is most appropriate for you. The mistake is not even considering this in the first place. Hey folks, just a quick heads up. If you're struggling with conditional access at your company, check out Threatscape's Conditional Access for Zero Trust service. It's an expert-driven framework for conditional access that eliminates gaps, makes it easy to manage, and can be fine-tuned to the unique needs of your tenant. You'll find the link in the description. Now let's get back to the video. That takes us to mistake number two, which is not considering and not customizing cross-tenant access settings. For that, I'm going to head up to the search bar and I'm going to search and find cross-tenant access settings. Now, within here, this is where we get to choose either at a default level or on a pair tenant level, what are the different inbound, outbound, and trust settings for other tenants? So what does that mean? Well, by default, anyone can become a guest in our tenant. Also by default, anyone in your tenant can become a guest in another tenant. So we may want to have different rules for different folks. Let me illustrate that with an example. We're going to head to organizational settings and I'm going to add another tenant here. I'll add in a lab tenant I got. If I can get the name right, we'll punch that in there. And we can assume that, hey, this is a trusted partner that we work with. So we're going to punch that in there. 
Then if I head over to the default settings, this is where we choose what happens for everyone. Actually, by default, including that named partner. We got our inbound settings, which lets us choose who gets to become a guest uh, in our tenant and the rules that they have to follow. We also got our outbound settings, and that's the one I'm going to use in this example. Where, for example, if I go to edit outbound settings, I could say we're going to block access uh, for outbound guests by default. And that means that my users can't become guests in other tenants. Your mileage may vary. You may or may not be able to get away with that. Point is you need to consider it as far as your risk profile. And to put a little more nuance on that, what we could then say is we could then go to that organizational settings and pick that tenant or list of tenants that we've added. We could head to the outbound access and change that away from inherited by default to actually say, well, actually for that tenant, we're going to allow access. And again, you can have different rules for different folks by using users and groups within that. The mistake here is assuming that a one-size-fits-all approach is the right thing for you to do you can apply a little bit more nuance to it. That kind of takes me to mistake number three, which is just going into something in a little bit more depth in those cross-tenant access settings. I'm going to head back to the defaults. I'm going to go to inbound settings. I'm going to go to trust settings. And I'm going to call out these options here. You'll see that by default, these are unticked. Trust MFA, trust compliant devices, and trust intra hybrid joint devices. What this means is... If someone is a guest in my tenant, as they authenticate, I will look to their enter tenant and I'll say, well, if you've satisfied MFA in that tenant, you don't have to do MFA again in my tenant. Now, on the surface, you might think, well, I'd rather they did MFA again. And you're, you're kind of right. You, you can't do that. So you would set up a conditional access policy that says, hey, for my guests require MFA. All we're doing here is saying, well, if you've already satisfied it, we're going to trust that satisfaction. And you might put uh, some nuance there and have things like session policies that would control it a little bit more. What I would draw your attention to is the fact that if we don't trust MFA from other tenants, we cannot enforce fish-resistant authentication for those users. Fish-resistant authentication can only exist in one tenant at a time, and that has to be their home tenant. Therefore, if we want to get that kind of highest level of security for our authentication methods, we have to enable that and then enforce that fish resistance through a conditional access policy. And we get a ton of content on conditional access on the channel that you can check out. Same story goes for compliant devices and hybrid joint devices. Back in the bad old days, we couldn't enforce compliant devices or hybrid joint state for guests, but now we can. And again, you might intuitively, and that gut reaction might be, well, I don't know what their compliance rules are, so why would I trust them? And the reality is, well, it's either that or you have no control over it at all. So consider that as part of kind of your maturity model where you work with partners to uh, kind of get those good compliant devices in a healthy state. And again, just throw as much security at this as you can. So that wraps up mistake number three. And mistake number four, we're going to pivot over to the SharePoint Admin Center. I'm going to go to admin.microsoft.com slash SharePoint. Then I'm going to head over to policies and I'm going to go to sharing. There's tons of stuff in here we can configure to really lock down and make it hard uh, for guests to kind of do anything. Oftentimes that's not going to be appropriate. We may have to allow a lot of guest access just so that folks can get the job done. And that's totally cool. I'm going to call out some things that may be useful to know if you're in that situation where we can't restrict guests entirely. The organization has made a decision that, hey, we're going to allow new and existing guests. We're going to allow anyone access. I still want to do as much as I can. And one of the things that comes to mind for me on that regard is under this option here for more external sharing settings, you'll see this is ticked by default. This option here called allow guests to share items they don't own. And what that allows a guest user to do is if they have been invited to collaborate on a SharePoint file or a OneDrive file, well, that basically means that that guest can share with other guests, who can share with other guests, who can share with other guests. You get the idea. There's some scenarios that may be totally fine for you. Fair enough. To me, this is about highlighting something that's quite often counterintuitive. And I just want to make admins aware that this is typically the kind of thing you can turn off and folks will expect that this is the way that SharePoint should behave by default rather than the way it actually does. The trade-off is there for you to decide. Now, the final mistake that I'm going to call out in this kind of rapid fire 
session is heading back to the Intra Admin Centre. Let's head to Identity Governance. Now, Identity Governance, it's got that new ID Governance license SKU, but what I'm about to show you, you can actually do it at that P2 level or E5, where I'll head into the ID Governance dashboard. Uh, do I? Oh, sorry, I want to go into Access Reviews, I think it is. I'm going to go into Entitlement Management because it shows the same thing. And I'll go into Connected Organizations. And within Connected Organizations, what I can do is, similar to how I added a tenant previously, I can add another tenant here. So maybe I've got a partner that I work on. Maybe it's a company who's providing some degree of outsourcing or consultancy or whatever. They're a partner organization. We can connect that organization to our identity governance. And the advantage of that is that then we can set up access packages for them. What's the advantage of an access package? Well, it allows us to grant permission to things like groups, SharePoint sites, things like that. And I'll tell you what, let me go to Entitlement Management Access Package and show you the kind of things. I'll just fill this out with some fluff. Groups and teams, applications, SharePoint sites, and then currently in preview intra roles, that does require that add-on license and it only applies for less privileged roles too. Why is this useful? Well, I want you to think about the way you may be currently doing it. So a guest user needs access to something. Maybe that goes through as a ticket. Maybe it goes through just as an email to your mailbox. There's probably not a whole bunch of management for it. And if there is, it's often held together with just a whole bunch of scripts. Whereas if we facilitate that access for a guest to something like a team or a SharePoint thread using access packages, to me, the coolest thing that we can then do is require the approval both of internal folks or external folks who say, hey, yes, this is actually going to be uh, a requirement for that user. And then really cool as well is that lifecycle control insofar as we can then have recurring checks where either the user can self-attest, yes, I still need access to this, or someone like their sponsor or the group owner can say, well, you know what, actually, you are no longer working on this project with us. We can just pull that out. And this kind of helps us move away from that problem where standing access just exists forever and ever and ever. Automates that process. So these were kind of five rapid fire common mistakes that we often see with regards to intra guest management. When I was kind of coming up with this list, I actually wrote down about 15 things. So there's an awful lot more that we could cover. Let me know in the comments if there's interest in that. And make sure you subscribe to Threatscape's YouTube channel because we get a ton more content about stuff like this coming up. See you in the next video.